As Speaker of the House, I solemnly and sadly open the debate on the impeachment of the President of the United States. The question is on the first article of impeachment. Senators, how say you? Is the respondent, Donald John Trump, guilty or not guilty? We find a lot of examples where Democrats were putting their political concerns over strategic fact-finding uh, to just try to lay out the case. And, and privately, they have told us that they sort of, they didn't, they did a half-baked impeachment. We, we are seeing the corrective action, basically, taking place in the way and the procedures in which they've go, gone forward with the January 6th committee's investigation, which is going over a lot of similar ground as at least the second impeachment and trial did. And so that is almost a tacit acknowledgement of, you know, we had the opportunity to take these steps almost two years ago, and we chose not to take them. Hello, welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Leanne Caldwell, an anchor here at Washington Post Live and also co-author of the Early 202 newsletter. Today, my guests are Rachel Bade, co-author of Politico's Playbook, and the Post Karun Demergen, who is the Pentagon correspondent here at the Washington Post. Karun, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about your book, Unchecked, which is the untold story behind Congress's botched impeachments of Donald Trump. I'm so excited to have this conversation. Thanks for thank having us. So and of course, to our audience, to our listeners and watchers, we would love to hear from you. So feel free to tweet us questions at Post Live. So you guys, I'm just so thrilled to be talking about this fascinating page turner. Um, before we get into it though, I wanna ask each of you, uh, why did you decide to write this book? You guys covered these impeachments. So why did you wanna write a book about it, Karun? Right, it wasn't covering it difficult enough. Um, I think Rachel and <laughs> exactly. I realized as we were covering it, look, we had this idea while the Democrats were in the middle of the investigation phase, pulling together their case for the first interview, we were spending most of our lives staking out the skiff in the basement of the house side of the Capitol and realized that this was moving very, very quickly. As much as we were covering every twist and turn, there were things that we didn't have time to run down. Questions about what was happening behind closed doors, questions about why certain decisions were being taken, but everything was moving at such a fast clip that we realized, wait a second, there's more here to be uncovered. And, and this is a significant moment that is happening. Presidential impeachments are extremely rare. They had never been one happening before that was entirely, uh, the genesis was entirely on Capitol Hill with, with no special counsel or prosecutor handing them the case. And so we kind of approached each other saying, wait a second, do you want to write a book about this? Should we take some time to look into this more deeply and try to figure out what we didn't have the, the bandwidth, frankly, and nobody did to figure out in real time. And the project ended up going from being about one impeachment to as we were finishing the manuscript, January 6th happened, so it became about two impeachments and this treasure trove of information about different uh, different choices made, punches pulled, decisions that happened behind the scenes that nobody got to see, but that are so important for documenting this missing piece of history in this very, very vibrant time of the Trump presidency and the impeachments and trials um, that also serves as a cautionary tale for what could happen in the future. Karin, you yeah. want to talk about yeah, the, to the, the standing outside the skiff. But you guys were both at the Post at the time during that, and I was at NBC, and we used to call it the pit of despair, standing there for <laughs> hours and hours and hours. So, Rachel, I want to hear about your experience, why, why you decided to dive into this, and what sort of challenges arose that you weren't really expecting? 
Yeah, I mean, just to sort of echo what Karin said, um, you know, these two impeachments were highly covered uh, on the cable news networks, every paper here in town. Uh, but there was always sort of this sort of undercurrent that was not well covered. And it was sort of what people were saying off the record at the time. Uh, there were a lot of Democrats who were not happy with the process. And as we got closer and closer to that first impeachment vote, we started hearing not remorse over impeaching Trump, because obviously everybody thought you know, he had committed impeachable offenses, but sort of a regret that they hadn't built a stronger case. I mean, you could look at the poll numbers at the time. Uh, Trump, uh, he was on the rebound. Uh, by the time he was acquitted, his uh, Gallup poll numbers were the highest they had ever been. And then we would also hear from Republicans uh, about talking about how what Trump was doing was crazy or they were very concerned about his actions. But you never heard this uh, publicly. So we just felt like there was another layer to this story, a deeper layer that we knew it would take time for people to open up. And it was sort of perfect for a book in terms of challenges. I mean. Yeah, I'm just going to say in terms of challenges, um, you know, Karin and I, we've faced an, a lot of them, I would say. I mean, um, there's clearly people in town who didn't want some of this narrative out there. Um, there are Democrats who benefit from this prevailing wisdom that they did everything they could to check Trump and just blaming, you know, the Republicans um, for the fact that Trump was acquitted twice. But I mean, look, things are not black and white like that. Um, and because of that, you know, we got some pushback. We had some offices who were initially cooperating with our book that once they learned about certain things we had uncovered, uh, that were not supposed to be released to us, uh, stopped cooperating. Specifically, we talk in the front of the book about Pelosi's office and how they um, they initially cooperated and then decided to stop and then proceeded to go around and lecture uh, and yell at sources they suspected had cooperated with our book uh, for revealing too much. So there's definitely challenges. Um, we can talk about some other ones if you want. But I mean, Karin and I just, we sort of, we knew we had the goods and we knew we had a narrative that was true um, and one that was not out there and really challenged the prevailing wisdom surrounding these impeachments and then it really needed to be told. So we stuck with our guts. You know, as I was covering this as well alongside you guys, I always thought you two were such a great team because Karin, you had the national security experience and the expertise. And then Rachel, of course, you were so well sourced among House leadership, um, congressional leadership, congressional offices. And so you guys broke a lot of news um, as you were reporting this in real time. But also, there's just so much more in this book. And one of the things that stuck out to me is at the beginning, how we knew that Pelosi did not want to go down this that path um, at the time. But your book really outlines and details um, how resistant she was how she was put in a box at multiple stages of the process through her judiciary chair, Jerry Nadler, and then ultimately by uh, a bunch of national security frontline Democrats. Uh, Karen, can you talk a little bit about, about that and explain a little bit more about how critical that was to get Pelosi on board and why she had to relent? Right. Well, just as a baseline matter, I mean, Pelosi kind of came of age as a leading Democrat in the in Congress during the Clinton impeachment years and learned through that experience that impeachment can blow back on the impeacher if it's not done perfectly. And so she kind of foresaw that this was going to be difficult. And given that she was trying to protect a majority that she had just won, becoming speaker again at the beginning of 2019, with the help of a bunch of moderate Democrats winning seats in districts that Trump had also won in 2016, she was very, very concerned about impeachment being a boomerang. And so she tried to, she used all kinds of measures to put down all these calls for impeachment coming from the more liberal wing of the Democratic Party that only intensified after the Mueller report came out. We document um, week by week, basically, how there was this band of Democrats on the Judiciary Committee. Led, people don't really know, but Jamie Raskin was basically the ringleader of that group long before he became the face of the second impeachment prosecution. Um, he said, we have to do this. He and his friends started to approach Nadler. Nadler said, but Pelosi will never go for it. You are going to basically have to stage a mutiny in the party and build up so much support 
that she can't deny it. She's going to have to go with it. We, we document how even, you know, Pelosi tried to put Nadler down as he filed petitions with courts to get information about the redacted information in the Mueller report, saying each time, oh, we're doing this because we're considering impeachment, even though Pelosi really had not given him the green light to do that. So there was a little bit of, you know, trickery going on. We, we refer to it in the book as something called the magic dick language, which was a pejorative term that the Judiciary Committee adopted um, in uh, kind of jeeringly about Pelosi's house counsel, uh, about uh, excuse me, Pelosi's staffer, um, who Richard Meltzer, who was putting down um, their efforts and kind of blocking for Pelosi. We show during the summer, that summer, she said, I don't care if I'm the last person standing, I'm not going to let this impeachment go ahead. And yet, by September, as the Ukraine allegations started to come out in the press, and it started to become clear about the role that Trump had played in trying to get Ukrainian President Zelensky to launch an investigation into the Biden family in exchange for him getting the military aid Congress had already approved for him. As those allegations started to become confirmed and solidified, you had the national, this band of uh, freshman members with national security experience, having worked for agencies, having military background saying, okay, well, we need to do something. They approached Schiff. Schiff is also talking to Pelosi. And it was painted at the time as being this organic moment of they wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post and the Pelosi just said, oh, of course, I have to go with, along with them. We show kind of hour by hour how there was several days of Pelosi knowing that this was coming, the national security freshmen trying to psych out whether they could get ahead of Pelosi or not. And this all being a very sort of reluctantly dragging the speaker into a position where she had to say, OK, I'm going to go ahead because I have lost my people here but then never really being so embracing of impeachment that she was ready to let them run with it. She, she, she approved of impeachment, but she put it on a timeline. They had to be done by Christmas so that it wouldn't interfere with the 2020 election season. She would not let them open the aperture of the, the probe beyond the Ukraine allegations, even though, look, we didn't know at the time that there was going to be a resumed war between Russia and Ukraine. It was a hard thing for people to sink their teeth into. People wanted her to follow the money, to look at the emoluments violations. She basically said, no, we're finishing by Christmas. We're doing it this way. We're getting it done, which is not the way. It's a way to maybe try to protect your political weak flank, right? But it's not a way to make sure that you're upholding the strength of your subpoenas, the punch of the legislative branch's oversight that's guaranteed in the Constitution. Yeah, and then her annoyance with some of, of being pressured, um, not only by those members of the Judiciary Committee, Jamie Raskin, um, but also in others, but Jerry Nadler's insistence at the beginning, it, it, it led her to make a really critical decision, Rachel, um, I think is what I got out of your book, that she was going to, when she finally decided to move forward with impeachment, that she put it in the hands of Adam Schiff instead of when it tra traditionally is in the Judiciary Committee with Jerry Nadler. Um, can you explain that process and also the divisions that that exacerbated and perpetuated throughout the process? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for those of us who've covered the Hill for a while, I mean, we know that Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff are very close allies. He's arguably the chairman she turns to most uh, as leader of the House Intelligence Committee. She, he was handpicked by her uh, to sort of lead that very sensitive uh, panel. And so, you know, when she sort of looks in a mirror, you know, she, or she, when she looks at Schiff, it's like looking in a mirror, right? So they're very much of similar minds in terms of protecting the majority, being very cautious around impeachment. Um, she had turned to him in the first part of 2019 to help put down uh, some of these calls for impeachment in the caucus as Jerry Nadler and Jamie Raskin were spinning people in the opposite way. Um, so, you know, Pelosi, she obviously wants to control the process. If she sees impeachment as very politically risky, um, she wanted to have as much control of it as possible. And Schiff is someone who, you know, would defer to her on pretty much any matter, right? They're very close. Um, and she knew that since they were of very much a like-minded uh, position when it came to how to run this impeachment, he was someone who she knew she could trust. The problem with that is that, you know, Schiff already had a reputation amongst Republicans as someone they couldn't trust. Um, you know, he had gone out earlier, years before, and said he had seen classified evidence that 
uh, Trump colluded with Russia. And, you know, when the Mueller report came out, Mueller ultimately said, yes, Trump welcomed Russia's interference, but they couldn't find sort of proof of a conspiracy. Um, and so ever since then, Republicans, and not just, you know, your Jim Jordans, Kevin McCarthy's of the world, moderate Republicans, Will Hurd's of the world, didn't trust Adam Schiff. And so it sort of hindered the impeachment from the get-go because, you know, the possibility of Schiff actually turning Republican heads and changing Republican minds was always going to be a stretch. I do think it's interesting that she chose Schiff because, you know, one thing we recovered, we uncovered in the book is that Schiff in many ways was one of the people who gave that final push to Pelosi to do this impeachment that she did not want to do. Um, we uncovered um, some news about how Schiff was privately advising that group of national security Democrats that would write that very influential Washington Post op-ed uh, that sort of triggered Pelosi to embrace impeachment. And they had asked him over the summer to give them a warning if impeachment was happening. They did not want it to happen. They were concerned about the political risks. And they sort of corner ship and they say, we need a heads up if this is gonna happen because you know they, they wanna be able to prepare. And he says, don't worry, it's not happening right now, I'll give you a heads up. And so what happens after the Ukraine news breaks um, about you know this whistleblower report and allegations of quid pro quo, they corner him on the floor, these these national security frontliners, and say, um, you know, has is Pelosi going to change her mind? We have reporting in the book that at the time Pelosi was not looking to change her mind. I mean, she actually went on NPR uh, that same day and said, we don't know enough yet to make any sort of decision. Um, but Schiff tells these frontliners that he thinks, yes, uh, she's going to be changing her mind. And given these mo the fact that these are moderate Democrats. They know they're going to be attacked if they're seen as sort of being these Pelosi puppets who follow her on impeachment. So they decide they have to actually get out ahead of her. And so having this thought that she's going to endorse impeachment, which, again, we report at the time was premature uh, for Schiff to tell them, they start writing this op-ed. And that op-ed actually ends up cornering Pelosi because when she finds out it's coming, um, she knows she can't hold back the tide. And so, you know, there's that interesting little backstory between Schiff and Pelosi. But I mean, your question about him leading the impeachment, it obviously alienated a lot of Republicans uh, from the get go. And uh, that was a that was a challenge that he had to deal with, uh, obviously, throughout the whole process. Because, you know, the Republicans, when they first heard about this, as you guys write, um, they thought it was going to be very hard to defend Donald Trump. Uh, and they turned mostly to a process argument. They made it into a debate over process and an unfair process and, you know, an unfair impeachment because they are having no voice, et cetera. So, Karin, um, did Schiff, was choosing Schiff a tactical disaster on Pelosi's behalf because of what Rachel said? They, she, he didn't have the trust of Republicans. They didn't like him. Um, you know, people blame Schiff for uh, for um, making Elise Stefanik an extremist, more extreme now. Um, and so was this, you know, this process argument, did it help to play into Republicans' arguments since they couldn't really defend Donald Trump on the merits? Yeah, I mean, there's two things going on here simultaneously. Schiff was such a boogie men for the GOP, that it gave them something to shoot at. If they had nothing else to shoot, they could say, well, Adam Schiff is trying to trick you because he's, you know, shady Schiff and all the various nicknames that Trump had already come up with by that point. So it gave them, you know, an Achilles heel that they could try to strike. The process stuff that was going on, though, is happening kind of at, at the same time. Look, there was an argument for giving Schiff part of this process. They didn't have an evidentiary record. They did not have a handoff from a special prosecutor. And so Schiff could have done that phase. But they boxed Jerry Nadler into a corner so there was never the parallel phase of what had happened in previous impeachments happening in that committee. And yes, that was a strategic choice by Pelosi. But because they were, look, there's no rules in the Constitution about what process you follow when you're going to impeach. It's all based on the precedent. But in the impeachments before this, you would have had bipartisan buy-in, at least for the get-go of like, let, should we launch a probe? Yes, we should launch a probe. That didn't happen this time. It was all Democrats for the first impeachment, no Republicans. And the Democrats didn't even try to reach out to their Republicans to talk about it ahead of time, which had happened in the Nixon cases and the Clinton cases. 
Um, there are the questions about, you know, how, how much access is there to information? Did they run down their subpoenas and actually try to get the firsthand witnesses? Again, that's something that was part of the Nixon and Clinton impeachments, but not part of the Trump impeachment. And so, yes, you pointed out that there's a great deal of hypocrisy on the part of the GOP leaders for this. They knew that they were cutting off the congressional um, oversight power as they were helping Trump. They didn't like it. They actually tried at first to convince Trump to comply with the process. And then when he said no, they basically turned around and said, OK, well, we're going to shoot at the process ourselves, even though we know this is bad for Congress's long term future. So a lot of hypocrisy there. That's what was happening in the House. Meanwhile, in the Senate, you have a band of Republicans who Mitch McConnell appoints to try to basically run Trump's defense because they feel like the process arguments aren't good enough for the Senate trial and they have to go harder and hit on the substance. So to combined, you know, it is the GOP knowingly taking advantage and knowingly shipping their own legislative power as they're taking advantage of this to block for Trump. But the Democrats basically could have, knowing, after we, we, we documented discussions where they see the potential for these attacks coming down the pike, but they don't actually make any sort of, you know, uh, they don't shift their strategy to anticipate it. They just kind of throw up their hands and say like, oh, well, we'll blame Republicans and that'll be enough. Republicans deserving of that blame, yes, but was that enough to actually keep it from happening? No, and that's the point that we're trying to make in, in illustrating all of this is that based on the reporting, you know, there were these these, these moments where they could have a safeguard. They could have taken steps to to cut off those arguments at the past before they happen. And instead, they just railed heads first into them, thinking that they could control the messaging, which obviously they couldn't. The GOP was messaging very strongly at that point on those procedural grounds, saying it's not a fair fight. Yeah, uh, I just want to jump in. Yeah, go for it. Just to give a couple, couple of quick examples in this specifics. I mean, we report in the book that Francis Rooney, who is a conservative from Florida, personally approached Pelosi on the House floor and said, look, uh, I'm willing to impeach Trump, but I need to hear it from somebody's mouth that he, that Trump himself was orchestrating this quid pro quo. He wanted a John Dean, somebody who, you know, could do that. And the witnesses that the Democrats brought in were obviously sort of lower level. They weren't Trump's inner circle, right? Um, which was a big difference from what, you know, lawmakers did during Nixon's day. Um, but Pelosi basically told him no, um, even though he said he would be willing to impeach. There's another example we have in the book about Jamie Herrera Butler, who plays a huge role in the second impeachment. Uh, we can talk about that when we get there. But she was actually standing up behind the scenes in Republican meetings saying, why shouldn't I vote for this? Um, she believed what Trump did in Ukraine was bad, potentially even impeachable. But we show in real time how leaders like Kevin McCarthy and Steve Scalise are able to capitalize on a lot of the process uh, issues that Democrats had to sort of spin her up and say, look, this isn't fair. Um, there's no due process for the president. Uh, they're mm -hmm. totally sidelining us and not looping us in on anything. And they actually like print out side by sides of the resolution sort of laying out the rules of the road for this, these, this impeachment and the ones used for Clinton and Nixon. And they use that to whip members like Jamie Herrera Butler in line, and she's not the only one. Um, so look, there were opportunities, and we say in the book, Jamie Herrera Butler personally was like, why have Democrats not uh, come to me to ask about this process? Like, if they had looped in some of these moderate Republicans who did have a problem with what they were seeing, would the result have been different? Could potentially they have gotten one or, or two or three House Republicans to vote to impeach, with the, which then might have led to a different result in the Senate? Um, yeah. Who knows? Uh, but the process issue was very much front and center for the GOP. And moving over to the Senate real quick for the impeachment trial for the first impeachment, um, before we get to the second impeachment, um, you know, there was also... On the Republican side, as you mentioned, Mitch McConnell was helping to orchestrate Trump's defense, which I want you to go into briefly as well. But also people like Susan Collins, a Republican, was challenging McConnell, you write, about the process and that he was undermining the process and not doing it the way that the Clinton impeachment was done. And he's making it a much more a partisan process. Um, Karin, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so there's, again, what I said a moment ago about impeachments aren't, there's no um, rules of how to impeach written into the Constitution. High crimes, misdemeanors, treason, treason, bribery, but not here's the steps that you follow to do it. So what 
they rely on is what happened before. Nixon's impeachment is considered the gold standard. It was a long, long investigation. They had hearings that laid out the case of the public that took months upon months. They had a uh, bipartisan buy-in at the beginning and crafting the rules of the road. And they ended up getting such a bipartisan, slowly building up so much of a bipartisan coalition against what Nixon had done that he ran away from the office before he could even be impeached. The Clinton time basically followed that model, not in terms of the substance of the impeachment, not in terms of the, where it ended, but from where it started, it said, okay, the, we're going to basically do it the way that Nixon did it because that worked. And so what Susan Collins does is she basically prints out a copy of the rules of the road for the Clinton impeachment and says, Mitch McConnell, you said we wanted to follow the Clinton model. I'm going to hold you to that because McConnell starts making decisions to try to, you know, maybe throw out charges because Trump is pressuring them. Remember, Trump doesn't want to be on trial. He wants them to get rid of everything he wants. He thinks that the whole thing is a witch hunt. So they're trying to manage that, too. But we document basically how McConnell's getting pressure from his moderates. And in the Senate, the moderates matter and they matter a lot more than it mattered in the House because the House, it's as we know, it's majority rule by fiat. The, the, the Republicans could, could rally around the message of like Trump is wrongful, wrongfully maligned here. But in the Senate, I mean, we document how Ted Cruz basically said to Trump's lawyers, there's not going to be a single person in this Senate that actually agrees there was no quid pro quo here. So stop saying it. You need to just make this argument. The quid pro quo is part of doing business and it's OK. That's happening at the same time as there's these process arguments being made about precedent from the Susan McConnells. At the same time that McConnell is putting the squeeze on Lisa Murkowski to say, if you don't vote against witnesses, we are going to drag the judicial branch into a dumpster fire if you make Roberts break a tie on a witness witness vote. And all of these things are happening at the same time. But it, it's like a different set of procedural and substantive arguments that end up mattering in the Senate that also end up dragging things into the gutter in terms of what the precedent now is for how you go about doing things. And that is kind of the end of the day story that even if you know we can have debates about whether or not doing this differently would have resulted in a conviction, especially for the first impeachment, I think. But but we know, based on what happened, that the precedent now for impeachment, two of the four impeachments that have ever gone to fruition and two of the four impeachments that were ever started in modern history, the bar has been significantly lowered, which means that it's easier to jump over based on not very much of this case in the future. Yeah, and that's very relevant now as uh, House Republicans could win majority of the House in the midterm elections. Lots of talk about impeachment already. Um, so I want to now fast forward to the second impeachment. I know you know most of your book is on the first because that's all we, you thought you were going to be writing about was one impeachment, but there was a second. And you know, just big picture, can you talk about the the shift from the night of January six to a couple weeks later, the political shift, especially in the Republican Party, on the issue of impeachment. Rachel? Yeah, I mean, I would just say, you know, after the first impeachment, um, you know, even though it was there was obsessive media coverage on the first impeachment, I mean, the headlines, people following them, they really faded as quickly as they sort of, sort of started. Um, and so when the second impeachment came around, obviously after January 6th, there was anger we show in the book by both sides, like people who were furious at Trump. Um, we do a TikTok in the book uh, where Pelosi, McConnell, McCarthy, uh, Scalise, Schumer were all together at Fort McNair, uh, basically trying to save the Capitol and sort of illustrate this role they played behind the scenes, trying to get Pence to give that order to move the National Guard. Um, and like there was a moment there where, you know, Trump's his popularity very much dipped. There were Republicans who were very much having a, um, you know, a crisis of conscience about how to handle him and what to do from there on. And for Democrats, there was an effort that very night by the same members who sort of were spinning up a mutiny in the first impeachment, uh, Jamie Raskin, his friends like David Cicilline um, and Ted Lieu they actually put it to Pelosi that night to see if she would allow a vote that evening to impeach Trump again. She said, no, uh, focus your attention elsewhere. And so, you know, they moved on. Uh, but in terms of Republicans, um, obviously Republicans were angry that night, but within a few days were starting to look for an excuse to 
not convict the president, not vote to impeach. Um, and this all had to do with, you know, political opportunism. It's uh, this guy, they've always sort of been afraid of him. If you've covered Republicans on the Hill, they say a lot of terrible things privately about Trump. But then when it comes to actually saying something publicly, they just they don't do it right. Um, we have reporting in the book about how McConnell was really struggling with this decision. He uh, thought Trump committed impeachable offenses, but he had members out there saying that if you're going to vote to convict, you can't be leader anymore. Uh, so he would probably have had to retire if he did something like that. And then there was this argument by Republicans that um, you can't impeach a former president or you can't have a trial to try a, a president who had been impeached once they left office. And McConnell originally thought that idea was baloney. And we show in the book that he uh, fought with his counsel about it, debated the idea. But ultimately, that's what he uses to justify his acquittal vote, uh, an argument that he yeah. himself yeah. was very skeptical of. Um, but again, I mean, it just shows, you know, Republicans, there was a moment, perhaps, um, we show in the book that you know, Jamie Raskin was trying to get GOP witnesses to testify in this second trial of Trump. He believed that if he could get somebody from, for instance, Mike Pence's staff to take the stand, that people like McConnell might actually vote to convict. Uh, and obviously, we can talk about why he caved on that, but that never came to fruition. And so you see, again, Trump escaping accountability um, and Republicans rallying around him. Yeah, there's been so much reporting about McCarthy in the weeks after, you know, going down to Mar-a-Lago, hugging the former president, essentially. Um, Mitch McConnell is a much more interesting figure. And we have sound from McConnell trying to kind of have it both ways um, during this process, uh, explaining his vote to acquit on February 13th. Uh, if we could play that. No question. None. That President Trump is practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of the day. No question about it. The people who stormed this building believed they were acting on the wishes and instructions of their president. But in this case, the question is moot because former President Trump, Trump is constitutionally not eligible for conviction. Yeah, and both McCarthy and McConnell are also, or both uh, living with the consequences of their decision today. Trump is still a leader of the Republican Party. So in the final minute or two we have left, Karin, can you talk about the lessons learned, perhaps? Did Democrats learn any lessons from this process? Um, and did Republicans, they are expecting, if they have the House, uh, if they have the House to um, investigate the Bush administration or the Biden administration. Do they expect the Biden administration to comply with these investigations? What sort of precedent does this have moving forward? Well, a couple lessons, basically. I mean, I think that you what you just showed right there showed that, you know, the, the Republicans were trying to have their cake and eat it too. Look like they're being tough on Trump, but, you know, also just giving him pass after pass. That speech that you played of McConnell, there is reporting in the book that shows that he didn't even really buy that argument he's making about this is all moot, that he is, show, thinks it's a procedural off ramp and he, and he takes it voluntarily. Um, I think that, you know, there are a lot of Politi on both sides, the politicians thought that they could control the political outcome of this experience a hell of a lot more than they actually were able to. Um, Trump is somebody that Democrats thought that they could put in the rearview mirror if they just sped through the impeachments to get to the election, or in the second case, to get on with the Biden agenda. But guess what? Two years later, we're still talking about President Trump. We're eyeing to see whether he's going to, when he's going to announce another run for office in 2024. The Republicans also thought, okay, well, if we just don't convict him, he won't turn into a martyr, and then he'll leave because he's not in office anymore. That proved to not be true. That was a bad gamble that people like Mitch McConnell made, thinking that they'd be able to control things. And now we're in this situation where we are coming, we have just finished the last, what's supposed to be the last public hearing of the January 6th committee. The January 6th committee's experience has, is really important to put in relief with the impeachments, right? Because clearly it's covering some of the same ground as did the second impeachment at least. 
it's a, in that way, it's a tacit acknowledgement that we didn't do everything we could here. And also keep in mind the way they've been investigating. They have run down their subpoenas into the ground. They have brought the Republican witnesses that the entire Democratic Party basically would not let Jamie, uh, Jamie Raskin bring during the second impeachment. They have followed these leads. But, you know, people that support the January 6th committee and the work they've done is quite incredible say, OK, well, you know, this, this is fixing it. Like now, now we are doing hard oversight and we are going to nail Trump. But the thing is, even if they succeed in every criminal, uh, con- uh, excuse me, every criminal um, referral that they want to send to the Justice Department, even if they succeed in bringing Trump to subpoena with the subpoena that nobody thinks he's actually going to respect, um, at the end of the day, it's not fixing what broke during the impeachments. The impeachments were about, can Congress flex its legislative branch muscle against an executive branch that doesn't want it to, that wants to prevent it from happening? The January 6th committee, if anything, has the help of the executive branch and the Biden administration right now in trying to do these fixing steps that they are trying to take to reassert congressional authority, the strength of a congressional subpoena. But it doesn't say anything about what might happen next when there is a president that doesn't want to comply with them. Because that's the situation in which the impeachment matters, when you're talking about potential removal. And also, there's another lesson here, and I'll, I'll let Rachel have the last word, but just one other one other quick point, which is that, you know, we're looking at a situation here where we likely are having a GOP takeover of the House. We know that they have promised to impeach Biden and several members of his cabinet. And, and, and you know, right now we've got a recent legacy of impeachments where it doesn't take much to do that. You can do that with just one party support. You don't have to run your subpoenas to the ground. Maybe you shouldn't even expect to, because maybe the point isn't to actually oust a president, but just to express political animus of a higher than normal order. And that leaves us in a situation where that's constitutionally problematic. Yeah. You guys, this was so great. We are so far over time. I really appreciate it. (laughs) Everyone, Karn Demergen and Rachel Bade, everyone, please read their book, Unchecked. The Untold Story Behind Congress's Botched Impeachments of Donald Trump. It's fantastic. Um, I covered this every day and I learned so much and you will too. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it, both of you. Thanks Thanks for having us. Mm -hmm. And thank you for watching. To find more of our programming, you can go to Washington Post Live or WashingtonPost.com and see our programs, this transcript, and rewatch this program if you'd like. Thanks for joining us.